The Aircast Air Select Series. The Elite, Standard, and Short. Synonymous with comfort, control, and healing. The most advanced and lightest full shell pneumatic walking boots available. Air Select. No other walking boot offers more. Soft strike technology dissipates force through the heel strike. A patented grid design puts a matrix of shock absorbing material in contact with the heel. The result, cushioning that reduces heel loading and prevents impact related stresses. The integrated inflation system is easy to use. Patented air cells put the patient in control of a customized fit. Exclusive duplex technology combines the semi-rigid shell and overlapping air cells that produce a graduated compression to promote faster healing. And Air Select semi-rigid shell has structurally engineered vents that maximize airflow and minimize mass without compromising support. Its unique shell is trimmable and heat moldable, making it easy to custom fit the boot. The Aircast Air Select series, the ultimate combination. Designed for comfort, engineered for healing. Hello, good evening and welcome friends and colleagues to the second BOFAS online journal club, which this evening focuses on the vexed topic of Morton's neuroma, or perhaps more accurately, Morton's misnomer. On behalf of both the Education and Scientific Committees of BOFAS, I'd like to thank our sponsors, DJO, without whose generous support, this venture would not be viable. In many ways, this is a step beyond the conventional journal club. This evening, only two papers will be discussed. Each will be presented by a fellow, and then subsequently we will hear the comments of the senior author of each of those papers. So in some ways this is as much uh, an author's retrospective uh, as it is a conventional journal club. The moderator of the first session is Mr Dave Townsend, my honourable colleague on scientific committee, and therefore without further ado I'd like to hand over to Dave to start our first session. Take it away Dave. Got the mute. Uh, thank you, James, and uh, good evening to everyone who has uh, joined us tonight. So our first paper for you this evening uh, will be uh, Non-Surgical Treatments for Morton's Neuroma, a Systematic Review, and that was published in the Foot and Ankle Surgery Journal in 2019 um, by the Leicester Group. Uh, we're very honoured uh, to be joined uh, this evening also by the senior author, uh, Mr. Manish Bhatia is a consultant foot and ankle surgeon at the uh, University Hospital of Leicester. Um, he's widely published um, and uh, is a member of the EFAS Scientific Committee, uh, having um, served a term on the BOFAS Scientific Committee. Um, so before uh, Manish joins us, um, I'll hand over to um, Adrian Kendall, uh, who's a fellow uh, currently in Oxford, uh, who's going to give us a summary of um, the paper. Hello, my name is Adrian Kendall. I'm one of the fellows at Oxford, and I'm going to summarise this really informative and useful systematic review uh, produced by Mr. Bhatia and the team at Leicester. And this is looking at non-surgical treatments for Morton's neuroma. In the introduction, they describe the neuroma and how it commonly affects the third plantar digital nerve. Um, they state the case that there are multiple different non-operative interventions available, such as stretching, orthotics, shockwave therapy, and various injections. And their aims are to identify significant evidence in favor of non-operative therapies and to assess the outcomes of these interventions. In terms of their methodology, they use the PRISMA guidelines um, to perform the systematic review. They use specific search terms uh, entered into three large databases, Medline, Embase, and the Cochrane Central database. Uh, so in addition, a manual search was performed um, 
uh, using Google Scholar and also PubMed. Any surgical paper or non-human study or any case study was excluded. And the two uh, main authors um, looked at the data independently and then cross-referenced their results. In general, they tried to find papers that had um, patient reported outcome measures, uh, an assessment of pain, uh, assessment of satisfaction level, and also ultrasound results. And they used the modified Coleman criteria to assess the quality of the studies. In terms of their results, there were over 480 uh, papers um, that weren't duplicated, and of these, 22 were felt to be eligible for quality assessment. Within those 22 studies, there were nine non-operative treatments, including corticosteroid injection, alcohol injection, shockwave therapy, radiofrequency ablation, cryoablation, capsaicin injection, Botox, orthotics, and also YAG laser therapy. Taking these briefly in turn, the authors felt there was a good evidence base for the use of steroid injection. This was based on two series and three randomized controlled trials, one of which was between uh, unguided versus guided injection. And the vast majority had good pain relief for at least 12 months, about 50% recurred, and a third required surgery. In comparison, um, seven series totaling 921 neuromas that um, were treated with alcohol injection had good short-term relief, but only about 30% had um, relief that was sustained at 12 months. In addition, there was no standard concentration of alcohol used, and um, a large proportion had um, pain and stinging and burning associated with the injection. Two small non-comparative cohorts failed to show any significant improvement with the use of shockwave therapy. Um, in terms of radio frequency ablation, there was uh, one prospective series and two retrospective series totaling 82 patients. And in general, over 80% were satisfied, but the follow-up was relatively short-term. A lot of these patients had other non-operative treatments, and so those results might be confounded. Um, and interestingly, 10% experienced severe pain, and up to 40% had difficulty wearing shoes after the ablation. In terms of the remaining five, there was limited evidence uh, for their use. Um, cryoablation was found to have only 38% relief um, over a um, 12 months follow-up, um, but there were minimal complications in the single prospective series. There was a randomized controlled trial for capsaicin injection, and 70% of patients had at least half of their pain improved by the injection. But interesting, the, the placebo effect was very high in this group, and 50% um, experienced complications from the injection, again, particularly burning, stinging, and pain at the injection site. Um, Botox was um, looked at in one series of 17 neuromas and 70% had some improvement over a short-term follow-up of three months. A randomized controlled trial of orthotics found no benefit at four weeks. And finally, a single series of 31 neuromas treated with laser therapy showed a reduction in lesion size and an improvement in transducer pain, but there was no patient-reported outcome measure and the follow-up was only two months. So in conclusion, the authors felt that um, there was uh, sufficient evidence for the continued use of corticosteroid injection, specifically that um, the vast majority get one year's improvement at least, and 50% recur after a year. They felt that alcohol had poor longer term outcomes and was associated with significant local morbidity. There was insufficient evidence to support the use of shockwave therapy, capsaicin, Botox, orthotics, or laser therapy, um, but radiofrequency ablation and cryoablation showed some promise and required well-designed randomized controlled trials in the future. Thank you very much. Many thanks, um, 
Adrian, uh, for presenting this paper. Uh, I would like to thank BOFAS for uh, uh, inviting me and it's a matter of honor and privilege. I would also like to uh, thank my co-authors uh, who helped me in this study, um, uh, Lauren, Randeep and Pip. So as um, uh, I mean, the objective of this study was to see which non-surgical modalities are effective for treatment of Morton's neuroma. And we uh, looked at nine modalities, uh, looked at the evidence published in the literature. Uh, the methodology was uh, appropriate for systematic review, PRISMA guidelines were followed and uh, the papers were scrutinized. Uh, using eight criteria, uh, Copeland criteria. So of the nine modalities, um, there was no improvement with um, insoles. Uh, there were a couple of studies with insoles, but uh, uh, both studies showed that there was, uh, the insoles were not useful for Morton's neuroma treatment. Shockwave therapy, there were a couple of randomized controlled trials, but both were a very short duration of follow-up. One was four weeks and the other was three months. And uh, uh, the interesting thing was that in the placebo group or the sham group, the, there were lots of people who were happy after shockwave therapy, not knowing that they were not having shockwave therapy. Laser treatment, um, there was only one study. Um, the biggest flaw of this study was the uh, patient selection and the Morton's neuroma size, which was very small. So average size of Morton's neuroma was uh, just over four millimeter. Uh, so that, that was uh, one of the biggest flaws for that. Uh, capsaicin, again, a very short follow-up of four weeks and uh, Botox, um, same thing, three months follow-up. So these obviously, I think on based on evidence, we can say that these do not work. Now the treatments which do work or showed some promise were uh, cryo and radio frequency. Um, although the effectiveness of uh, radio frequency is more than cryo, the problem is that about 10% of patients uh, experience significant pain after this treatment. And uh, uh, the follow-up um, is small, uh, nine months uh, after uh, radio frequency, uh, and, and the sample size is not huge, both for cryo and radio frequency. So we need more evidence to, to see if these, these modalities work. Coming to alcohol injections, um, the paper from Hughes from Stanmore uh, did show a lot of promise. 84% uh, patients uh, were completely cured following this uh, magical alcohol injection. But interestingly, uh, the same group of patients was followed up uh, um, from Kingston and uh, they published their results in um, Foot and Ankle International, uh, I think it was 2015. And uh, uh, of the uh, 84% uh, pain relief uh, patients experienced, uh, this only, uh, this, uh, in, in, in the Kingston group, there were only 29%, so one third of the patients who had pain relief. But the biggest issue was uh, one third of the patients also had quite significant issues like pain. Also, if after alcohol injection surgeries performed, that surgery was very difficult due to scarring. Um, so the treatment which we felt that showed promising non-surgical intervention is steroid injection. All of us use steroid injection. So the key messages um, from um, for, regarding steroid injection, number one, there is evidence to show that steroid injection is more effective than local anesthetic injection alone. That's a paper from Edinburgh. The second thing is um, size of Morton's neuroma. Uh, almost all papers, all evidence in literature says that size uh, is irrelevant. Doesn't matter uh, whether the neuroma is small or big. Only there's one paper uh, from UK, uh, Mackey's paper, which says that if the neuroma is small, uh, less than five millimeter, then it, it, it is more effective for the short term, six months, and after that, it doesn't work. Um, it has been shown, there's some evidence, a paper from Australia to say that if a steroid injection is performed early on, 
then the effect is better. Uh, we have uh, gone on and published a randomized controlled trial to see whether ultrasound uh, guided injections are more effective than ultrasound guided injections. And based on the randomized control study, uh, there was no difference. In, in both group of patients, the uh, failure rate at 12 months was about 50%. Um, we have subsequently gone and reviewed this uh, prospectively, this group of patients um, at five years. And uh, we have seen that uh, the, if the effectiveness of one steroid injection at five years is 38%. And if patients had two steroid injections, then that effectiveness was 55%. But the sample size is small, so one has to take it with uh, this interpretation with caution. So in all, I would say that uh, steroid injections work. Um, you know, about 50% of patients, there's a good chance that they will work for one year. And if, if they work for one year, then there's a good chance that they will work for the next four, four years. That, that's what the evidence uh, suggests at the moment as far as the non-surgical uh, treatment of motor sclerosis is concerned. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Adrian and Manish. Uh, that was that was excellent. Uh, I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions uh, in the end. And for the audience, uh, please post any questions you have uh, using the Q&A button. Now, our second paper uh, is based uh, on an alternative surgical option to neurectomy uh, and will be presented by Vidi Adukia, who is a specialty trainee at Leicester. And thank you, Vidi. Uh, these will be followed by comments uh, from the senior author. And it's a pleasure to welcome to the Bofas Journal Club, uh, Professor Matthias Rupp, uh, who is based at Klagenfurt, Austria. And though, although he confesses uh, to be a Viennese at heart, uh, Professor Rupp is a consultant plastic surgeon and head of the department. And we thought it would be valuable uh, to have the insights of a plastic surgeon on the topic. So thank you, Matthias, for your time. And sorry you miss part of the Netherlands-Austria game, but we wish Austria all the best. Um, it's off to you, Vidi. The aircast Hello, my name is Vidya Dukia, and I'm one of the trainees here in Leicester. Today, I'm going to be presenting a paper by Mishit and Metal titled Nerve Decompression According to A.L. Dellen in Morton's Neuroma, a Retrospective Analysis. So this paper was published in the Journal of Plastic Reconstructive Anesthetic Ger Surgery in 2020. It was a single center study carried out in Austria. And as the title suggests, it was a retrospective analysis of a case series of patients diagnosed with Morton's neuroma. So why is this paper important? Whilst Morton's neuroma is a common condition uh, affecting patients, especially women over the age of 60, its etiology is not well understood. Some studies suggest that the common digital nerve develops perineural fibrosis as a result of compression or stretching, whereas others uh, suggest a more traumatic or vascular insult. Non-operative management is usually carried out in the first instance, and this includes footwear modification, such as white toe box shoes, orthotics, anti-inflammatory medication, and steroid injections. However, when conservative measures fail, patients usually undergo surgical resection uh, performed through a dorsal approach. However, this procedure is associated with a high rate of postoperative complications, as shown by a systematic review published in the foot and ankle surgery by Vasilena et al. So the aim of this uh, study was to assess the efficacy of decompression of Morton's neuroma by division of the deep intermetatarsal transverse ligament that's highlighted by the black arrow here. And this was going to be done through a dorsal approach that was described by uh, Dr. A.L. Dellen, who's a consultant plastic surgeon in the United States in 1992. 
So all patients are diagnosed with Morton's neuroma over an eight-year period were included in the study, and patients with diabetes or polyneuropathy were excluded. Two senior plastic surgeons performed the procedure, and they did this through a dorsal approach uh, and divided the deep transverse intermetatarsal ligament, which resulted in the nerve sliding dorsally and the, met the metatarsal heads dispersing, thus creating more space for the common digital nerve. Patients were then followed up for at least six months postoperatively, and a change in their pain, function, and skin sensitivity were noted. This was done using, using the visual analog scale, the German foot function index validated questionnaire, and uh, using SEMS, Weinstein, monofilaments of bearing diameters. Statistical analysis was carried out using Wilcoxon signed rack tests, box plots, and Kaplan Meyer plots. So of the 13 patients recruited into the study, one was lost to follow-up. There was a wide age range of patients, with the average being 55.5 years, and only one patient was male. Interestingly enough, uh, patients had a significant improvement in their pain and function, and this was both at rest and on strain, as demonstrated by the p-values here. Um, and no significant difference was found in the skin sensitivity postoperatively. So the study had a clear aim, clear objectives, which it answered, and um, it included a wide age range of patients. However, there was no information given on any previous treatments that the patients had had for the Morton's neuroma, and whether any of them had any complications postoperatively. It was a small study, um, it was retrospective in design, and the patients had varied follow-up, ranging from six months to 18 months. So it can make it quite difficult for us to apply the results to the general UK population. Interestingly enough, a similar study uh, with similar sized, uh, similar number of patients has been carried out by uh, a group in Boston headed by Christopher Di Giovanni. And when the senior author was contacted for an informal email comment, uh, he stated that this is a relatively simple short-term study, but I think addressing an important topic and an equally important alternative yeah. surgical solution that burns no bridges, often works, and has little to no comparative risk. So in conclusion, nerve decompression by division of the deep intermetatarsal transverse ligament through a dorsal approach is an effective technique for the surgical management of Morton's neuroma. However, we do need randomized control trials comp comparing decompression versus a neurectomy um, in the future. Thank you for taking the time out to listen to me. Uh, these are my references. So hello, um, good evening, everybody. My name is Matthias Rapp. Um, I'm a plastic surgeon um, from Austria, living in the very south part of Austria, in Carinthia, in Klagenfurt. I'm the senior author of this, um, um, of this paper, which was presented, so I um, I have to um, be sorry for, please be sorry for my, for my English and for my background here. It's not a unique background used for this journal club. Um, um, uh, it's really an honor uh, to share um, with you my, my thoughts on uh, this uh, mentioned and discussed uh, paper. Um, first of all, um, let me take the opportunity to tell you that the, the term Morton neuroma is false. It's false. It is not a neuroma. A neuroma is when a nerve is cut and nerve fibers just grow out of this nerve um, 
without control and make pain. This is a neuroma. But under the condition of a metatarsal gear uh, and the so-called mort neuroma, we do not have a cut nerve. We have a nerve entrapment. The nerve entrapment is caused by the sharp edge of this metatarsal ligament. And I cannot share uh, the thought that we have to compare our decompression with neurectomy. And I will tell you why. Nobody will think about to cut the median nerve when you have, and when people or when a patient suffers from carpal tunnel syndrome, nobody will cut the nerve. So neurectomy of a nerve, when you have a nerve entrapment is strictly forbidden. So we, we deal with the nerve entrapment syndrome and we do not have to cut the nerve. So what we do is to decompress the nerve like we do it in carpal tunnel syndrome. We cut the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the ligament over the median nerve. And so we do the same uh, with the metatarsal gear of the modern metatarsal gear. So we cut the ligament above the nerve. And after the cut of the nerve, the nerve has much more space to, to um, uh, much, much more space. Uh, and this, um, the, the, the consequence is that the people, so the patients do not have any pain and uh, improve their sensitivity again. So uh, we deal with a nerve entrapment and not with a neuroma. The, um, the, the formation um, before the nerve goes underneath the, the ligament, it is a pseudoneuroma. So this is um, a swelling of the nerve, as you can see a swelling of the median nerve of a very, very severe carpal tunnel syndrome. So, and the only thing we believe is to, 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 to cure these patients is to, to, um, to cut the ligament and not to cut the nerve. The second disadvantage is when you cut the nerve is that you get a real neuroma, then you have, then you have as a consequence a real mortal neuroma when you cut the nerve, when you make a neurectomy. And beside this, you also lose sensitivity. So um, I just ask you and the auditorium, why do you cut the nerve when there is no need? I hope um, I can share my thoughts with you and um, I'm really looking forward for the further ongoing discussion. Um, thank you to um, all of our speakers tonight. Um, that's been uh, very informative already. Um, we now come to the, the second part of the evening, um, which is questions. Uh, we're seeing some questions uh, coming in from you already at home, um, but we'd encourage you please to, to keep posting them. Um, we're going to start off um, with a question for you, uh, Manish. Um, so you you mentioned um, an article you'd done looking at ultrasound versus blind injections. Uh, and the question is, um, there was another RCT by Santiago that did show a benefit of ultrasound guided injection over blind. You've shown uh, similar results. What's your technique for um, blind injection? So um, thanks, Dave. Yeah, I think that paper was published after ours. Um, our techniques, so all injections were performed by a, a very experienced MSK radiologist uh, who normally does uh, injections, who normally does ultrasound scan. 
all the diagnosis, the clinical diagnosis were confirmed and an ultrasound scan was done of both feet um, to confirm that the diagnosis was correct. Uh, so the technique was, it was a double blinded study. So um, the patients didn't know whether they were having an ultrasound guided or a sham guidance. So after the diagnosis was made, the, it, the, the, the camera was switched off and it was, it was blind. Same technique was used, same approach was used, same amount of local anesthetic and steroid was used, used for all, all the um, injections. So as far as we are concerned, we had taken into account all the variables uh, which could influence the outcome and all the injections were performed by the same guy. Um, so there was no bias from either the, op the, the uh, you know, somebody who was collecting the data as to who's performing the injections. Okay, I'll, I'll ask a follow-up question to that one because we're, we're really interested to know what, whether senior authors have changed practice based on their papers. So, so do you now inject your your room is blind in the in the clinic, and do you have a technique you can share, or or do you like me send them to the radiologist because it's quicker? So okay, the answer to that is I do send um, neuromas to the radiologist. I mean personally, I mean first thing is that I I think Morton's neuroma is a clinical diagnosis because I've seen a lot of ultrasound scan results which have been incorrect. Uh, I mean, I don't know, I don't want to, but there's sometimes sonographers reporting the results and an ultrasound scan is not a gospel truth. So we know the scan is as good as the person who's doing it. That's the first thing. So it's the clinical diagnosis. The second thing is that there is a use of uh, diagnosis, whether you use ultrasound scan or MRI scan. So I certainly would get a scan done if I'm going to operate before to confirm the diagnosis. But for diagnosis itself, I'm quite happy that, you know, we, we have published a paper and we have seen that in our hands, the clinical tools were 95 to 98% effective when we compared it to ultrasound scan. So it was. Great. I have done lots of injections and I, I look, thing is, I mean, the, the thing, the key point of the paper is that are you targeting the neuroma or you are putting steroid in the intermetatarsal space? And what this paper has shown that for the pain to improve, for the swelling to subside, you don't need to actually target the neuroma because with ultrasound scan, that's what you're doing. You're going into the neuroma, injecting there. Whereas if you inject outside the neuroma as well, it will be the same, same result. And that, that is what you know the, the summary of the paper is. So I, I feel that in my hands, I'm very comfortable and I'm sure you would be same as well, that you can inject the intermetatarsal space. If you inject in the intermetatarsal space and you're planted enough, you know, you need to, you, you don't want to inject superficially. Right. And third thing, which I actually see as a sign, whether I'm in the right or not, is that I see the splaying of the toes. So if you have injected one to two ml altogether of fluid, then you see if you're injecting in third space, the third and fourth toes spread out, which means that I'm in the space. And, and with those that I've seen, uh, there's no difference. So that's anecdotal. And then we approved it as well. Great. Thanks very much. Food for thought and some technique tips. <laughs> I think we have uh, a few from the audience. So there's, there's also there's a question from Jonathan Korsh. I think it's for you, Matthias. Or, um... Is there a downside to cutting the intermetatarsal ligament? Um, I think, I mean, I think probably the question is, we, we divide anyway, we're gonna do a neurectomy. Um, is there any biomechanical downside? Because obviously some surgeons, they transpose it dorsally and they repair the ligament. So is there, any, mm. is there any issues or have you come across any problems with just simply cutting the ligament. I guess we don't really see that much probably with when you do a neurectomy because you do the same thing anyway, but do you think there's any issues with cutting the intermetatarsal ligament? Yeah, good question. Uh, sure, uh, uh, patients get uh, after cutting the ligament a splay foot. So um, to avoid the splay foot after you do this procedure is to, um, to um, address, um, address um, um, the support of uh, to, to address support crutches crutches uh, for the first time, and then 
we, um, uh, we tell the patient to use uh, orthopedic shoe inserts uh, to avoid to, um, uh, to, to, uh, to develop a splay foot. So it's true uh, without any treatment um, and, and when you cut um, on two sides, uh, the, the ligament, so between two spaces of the metatarsal um, bones, they get, of course, they get the splay foot. But to avoid this, um, um, we, we use uh, special orthopedic shoe inserts. And uh, for the first time of mobilization, when it start to ambulate, we, we use support crutches. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so there's, there's lots of questions coming in, um, which is great. I'm afraid, Matthias, there's, there's a few more coming in on the, on the surgical side, um, but I'm going to ask Manisha another question. So um, this is a question that's come from uh, Ionis Papakristos, uh, and the question is plantar approach versus dorsal approach for injections. What are your thoughts? For injections? Uh, I mean, I, I'm a fan of dorsal approach. I, I, I use dorsal anytime. Plantar is very sensitive. Um, I don't think there is any need to go plantar. The only thing is that, actually, there's a, there's a lie. I, I, I'll, I'll rephrase my, I have done plantar injection, but only when, if I've told somebody that, look, after the injection, there might be some skin discoloration. And especially, you know, in dark, dark skin people, uh, I mean, there was a consultant in institutes in our department, and I told her that, look, if I do the injection, there's a chance there might be some cosmetic element to the afterwards, you might see some wasting and there might be some skin change. She said, no, I don't want that. And I did plant it for her. But in general, I, 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 I go dorsal because dorsal is more tolerable, plantar is more sensitive and painful. And I'm worried that they might, my, my face is there, they might kick me. Great, useful, thank you. <laughs> uh, there's another question for you, Matthias. Uh, it says a very interesting idea, makes sense, uh, however, is your approach in patients, what is your approach in patients who have ongoing pain after a ligament release? Have you had any of those 14 patients, 12 patients that come back or and what would you do if they probably is another diagnosis or what's your, what would you do next? To tell you the truth, I have no idea to do um, uh, further treatment with these patients because we do not have these patients. So after uh, the um, uh, release of this nerve entrapment, uh, uh, after cutting the nerve, we have a pain relief and the relief of the symptoms and uh, none of the patients um, uh, returned uh, and, um, um, and mentioned any, any, any um, symptoms after the um, nerve decompression. This is the truth. It's very simple. Okay. Mm. Okay. Um... So uh, another question we got from a, an anonymous attendee, uh, Manish, um, which isn't necessarily on the on the topic of of non-operative treatments, but I think interested in your your thoughts. So the question is: If there is a Morton's neuroma with a plantar callosity and relatively long second and third metatarsals, what would be your approach? So if, if there is a patient with uh, a plantar callosity, the first thing I'll do is get an x-ray for them uh, because I, wanted to, I want to make sure that there is no subluxation, dorsal plantar, or obviously medial lateral. Um, the length of the metatarsals is important as well. The clinical examination in this case becomes even more important because you want to be absolutely sure where the tenderness is. And this is one of the cases where you're not sure you need to get a scan done, either MRI scan or ultrasound scan by an experienced uh, person. But based on what you've described, my thoughts are that the pain is actually coming from the um, pressure, you can call it metatarsal here, because of long metatarsal heads, putting pressure, maybe plantar subluxation as well. And I would be very cautious. Uh, I think simply uh, there might be uh, five millimeter neuroma, six millimeter neuroma might be a red herring. So I'm very cautious and I'll go by a careful clinical examination uh, in this particular case because excising the neuroma itself might not do anything. Yeah, I think that, that's, that's a really useful comment. And we've had this conversation offline about the, the pathology that exists next to the room is that's often disregarded 
um, particularly by people referring in when they've seen a new rumor on a scan. And I think occasionally by us as surgeons diving in to, to take out new rumors when maybe a new rumor isn't the primary pathology. Absolutely, absolutely, I agree with that. And we have a question from uh, Dr. Guduri. Uh, do you advocate a planter approach for revision neurectomy? So Matthias, I'm sure you're probably seeing lots of neuromas after neurectomies for Morton's neuromas. Mm -hmm. How do you approach those? Do you go dorsal planter? What do you do with the nerve? What's your approach? Uh, sure. Um, to, um, um, for revision surgery, we use the planter approach because it's very, very um, difficult to do any neurolysis and to do any treatment on the, on the nerve on, um, with a dorsal approach. But uh, once again, uh, my take home message is for you that it is uh, no, it is the, the, the term motor neuroma is false. It is a swelling, a pseudoneuroma of the nerve, but it's not a real neuroma. And of course, we find neuroma, as you, as you mentioned, Con, um, after the nerve was cut. So after it was a neurectomy was done. And what we do is we do for some in instance, we do a loop, a loop uh, co-optation. So we, um, we just uh, take both nerves together and make a nerve suture. It's a kind of neuroma prophyla prophylaxis, a loop co-optation. Uh, and on the other hand, if it is possible, we uh, use nerve grafts, but this is uh, for some instance, very, very difficult to find the distal nerve stump uh, in this um, scar tissue. So the most frequent procedure we do is a loop co-optation or for some instance, we sometimes uh, take the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the nerve with the neuroma. We do not cut the neuroma because when you cut the neuroma, you cut another neuroma. Neuroma. So we do not cut it and we just uh, take the nerve back um, and cover it with muscle tissue or um, some very, very um, smooth tissue in, on, on, the on the plantar side. So to avoid any uh, further ongoing pain. Thanks, Matthias. Thanks. Um, so question for you, uh, Manish. Um, I think you mentioned in your talk uh, results from second injections. Uh, so the question is, do you have an opinion on repeat injections before proceeding to surgery, uh, timing, and in whom? So, I, I, uh, Dave, I, 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 I hate operating on Morton's neuroma because the results are so unpredictable. And I do my best not to operate. And, and if the injection has helped um, for a good few weeks, two months, three months, and the pain has come back, then I, I always uh, advise the patient that uh, uh, my advice would be to try another injection. It will boost up the response. There is a possibility that you might not need surgery. So I do try that approach. Of course, uh, there are patients who would not want to have it done. But in my experience, most people who have had some response or good response for temporary if you offer them another injection, they do take it. But yeah, I don't keep on repeating it because I think at some stage you have to decide because repeating too many injections too frequently can cause its own, has its own problem. So uh, I'm not afraid to try the injection if there is a good response to the first injection. Do you have an upper limit for number of injections? This is the thing, isn't it? Um, I mean, there are various guides. There are various guides which say that you should do, you should not do more than uh, one injection every three months. I don't think anything like that. But the problem with Morton's neuroma, hand and feet, is that you know you you get a lot of wasting by putting in steroid in that space, and then you you have some obviously calcification and some scarring. So if I'm not going to operate on someone, I know that I'm not going to operate on someone. Then I, there's no upper limit. Uh, I don't think I've done it, but I think that is what I, I uh, feel. Whereas. If somebody is fit, young, and I, I think two or three injections is the max I'll offer them. Uh, if the effect was only for six weeks, three months, etc. If they come back to me one year, two years down the line, then I think that's fair enough. But uh, if I'm going to operate, I'm worried that it might increase the risk of soft tissue complications, etc. And 
one of the worries with Morton's pneumoma sagittae is if, if you get a wound healing problem in that area, it, it can go on and on and on. So that is, that is why I don't go for more than two to three injections if I'm going to operate. Great. I'm feeling very reassured by your practice, Manish. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's another question from Andrea Ferrero. Um, it's about so you, uh, Matthias. Uh, what's your opinion or experience with endoscopic decompression of Morton's neuroma? So instead of having a, a two centimeter incision, you have a one centimeter incision. What's yeah. your, have you seen any of those? Have you, are you thinking of doing them? Good. Thank you, thank you, Con. It's a good question. I, uh, let me compare it with, uh, again with the couple tunnel release. Um, a few years ago, it was very in fashion to do endoscopic couple tunnel release, uh, and the, um, the results were promising. But um, we also published this um, uh, when releasing couple tunnel syndrome. We made a bilateral uh, comparison. So, we released on the one hand, on one patient. Um, an open approach and on the, on the other hand with the endoscopic approach and um, after um, follow-up of one year we, we saw no, no differences in, in the, in the, in the, in the post-operative follow-up. So it's, it's a very elegant method to decompress the um, uh, uh, metatarsal lig ligament. It's, it's a very elegant um, um, method but as you said it's only uh, the difference is uh, one centimeter shorter incision and uh, a much more expensive uh, procedure with a little bit limited uh, uh, vision and sight um, to, to, to treat the nerve. Thanks, man. There's a, another question um, come in from uh, Yaha El Hassan. Um, so, uh, Yaz actually asked four questions, so I'm going to ask two of them. Um, you, Manish. Um, so, so the first question was, do you inject all patients? No. Okay. So, no. No. Who, who don't you inject? Uh, if you think I'm, they have neuroma. Okay, Dave, I have four Morton's neuroma myself, proved by radiologist ultrasound scan two in each feet, you know, you scan patients. Uh, actually, there is a good paper um, which has shown that uh, I think it's about 30%, 35% people have asymptomatic motor neuroma if you scan, scan them all. So, so if a patient, if, if, if the symptoms have started very acutely, then my view is that just changing your activities, using sensible shoe wear, taking anti-inflammatories might actually nip it at the bud. And I think, and I've done it myself, lots of times it has happened to me and I've not had the courage to go for an injection. Not that, you know, I would prefer injection any day to surgery, but I try to uh, manage these patients without injection to the, in the very beginning. There are then patients when the pain becomes chronic, and then obviously, then 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 you have to um, go ahead and do something about it. But in the acute stage, I try. I think Matthias wants to say something as well. Oh, I'm, I'm That's I'll, okay. I'll ask the second question um, that uh, Yah has asked, and then maybe ask Manish first. But Matthias, his his opinion. So the question is, what is your thoughts on neuromas in two spaces. Um, so maybe Manish answer that and, and then we might ask the same to you, Matthias, because that, that probably has a <laughs> an answer from both. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Matthias, go ahead, please. No, 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 go, go ahead, Manish. Go ahead, please. I, I was, my answer was going to be very short. I was going to say that I don't know the answer. I actually, it's a very good question. And uh, we have done a systematic review, which hopefully will get published soon, just looking at this very important aspect because the incidence of um, simultane, uh, incidence of uh, Morton's neuroma in second and third interspaces is, is 27%. Almost one third of patients have it, if you scan it. Um, I don't like operating on two adjacent intermetatarsal spaces at the same time. And I try to defer it, but then looking from the patient's point of view, patients, it's, you know, for them, it's difficult. 
to have an operation done, wait for three months, six months, and then come back for another operation. So we have looked um, in the literature and there are, uh, there is a suggestion that uh, simultaneous excision of Morton's neuroma is, is, is doable and results uh, in, in, in good outcome. So this is what we have seen, but this is not what I practice uh, is the answer. Okay, and then Matthias, do you have a, an opinion on, on the two space neuroma? Yeah, if I get the question right, uh, we do we do um, two separated in, incisions and decompress both um, uh, both nerves. So we uh, cut the the ligament between the uh, second and third and third and fourth metatarsal bone. So if I get the question right, so yeah. uh, under two separate with two separate incisions. Uh, a, I think there's a couple of questions also coming via the chat button. Uh, there's a question from uh, Rick Brown. It's for Manish. Uh, the lack of evidence for orthotics was a surprise. Um, was a range of orthotics used? Uh, do orthotics work for bursitis uh, with no neuroma? Because I think the, from your studies, Manish, it was mainly for pronation, supination kind of deformities in orthotics rather than the traditional dome that we use to flow the metatarsals or spread the metatarsals. But what, what's your view on uh, Rick Brown's question? Yeah, so uh, it's, it's a very good question. And uh, um, uh, there were two uh, randomized controlled trials looking at the role of orthosis. And Con, as you have said, one was um, looking at pronation versus supination. And this was paper very close to us. Um, it was from Northampton. And there were 10 patients in one group and the uh, 11 patients in the other group. And they didn't see any difference and they didn't see any significant improvement in either group, uh, whether they, I mean, their, their, their thought process was that Morton's neuroma, especially of third interspace is linked to pronation problem, putting more pressure. And if you improve it, then, then it should help. And therefore orthosis, which correct pronation should have a better outcome, but they didn't feel. So that was one paper small sample size and looking at very specific um, aspect of pronation versus supination. The other paper was from Turkey. And again, it was a randomized controlled trial. And they looked at two groups. One of uh, the first group was the ones who had orthosis only. Uh, and the second group, uh, sorry, the first group was orthosis and injection. And the second group was two injections or multiple injections. And they found that the patients in the second group, two or more injections had a much better outcome rather than just the orthosis alone. So, so the evidence is not that great uh, in terms of looking for uh, specific insoles for Morton's neuroma. Uh, so, but, but based on the current evidence, we, you know, this is what I, I, I think is available, but probably there is a good shout for looking at some specific insoles made for Morton's neuroma and then comparing it with other treatment measures. Okay, thank you. Um, I think there's, a, there's another one for Matthias from Adrian Kendall. Uh, can I ask you if there are any tips for being sure that the nerve has been well decompressed if dividing the ligament? Uh, how far proximal, how far distal, and I guess you know, do you do a form of neurolysis? Do you just uh, dissect and follow the nerve after the bifurcation, remove any scar tissue, just divide the ligament? Thank you. Thank you, Kwan. Now, uh, we, we operate uh, with loop magnif magnification and under the loop magnification, but I'm sure also without, the, without loop magnification, you really see that the nerve comes up, turns up uh, and uh, now has enough space and in the in the in this soft tissue fatty tissue so you really see after and this is a kind of verification of a complete dissection of the uh, or split of the ligament that the nerve comes up and you see you see it you see the nerve suddenly after the cut of the uh, ligament you see the nerve coming up yeah and you don't That's, go dissecting it you don't go dissecting it 
no, it's just not, leave it. Okay. It's not necessary. Even okay. if there is any scar tissue formation, or then we do, of course, neurolysis, but not neurectomy. Okay. Okay. Okay, Grand. Um, so I have another question for you, Manish. Um, and this has come from uh, Mr. Mangwani, your colleague in Leicester. Um, so Manish asks, sorry, not Manish, uh, Jit asks, um, what factors predict the need for further intervention following a steroid injection? Oh, uh, pain. So sorry, the question is that wh why would you do anything else other than injection? Uh, I think maybe, so what, what are the predictive factors, I guess, uh, failed steroid injection that would then result in surgical intervention? Sure, sure. So based on the evidence which we have dissected, it has been shown that if, if a neuroma becomes chronic, then chances of the injection helping are less. So that a one, 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 it's not being sort of out, but, but it's one of the gist of a paper that the longer the duration of the symptoms was, then the effect of the steroid injection was less. The second is very commonly people uh, talk about the size of the neuroma. And um, in our experience, when we looked at the size and we looked at it different uh, ways, whether a bigger neuroma had less chance of um, getting cured, uh, et cetera. And, and we found that there was no difference whatsoever. We also looked at the group where the neuroma had, uh, the, the, the effect had recurred the pain had come back versus the successful injection. And the size of the neuroma in that particular group was 12.5 versus 11.5, where the, there was, so there was no, no, no difference. There's only one paper which says that if the neuroma is less than five millimeters in size, then steroid injection is effective. That too, only for six months. But to me, I mean, I don't call it a neuroma if it is less than five millimeter because I understand that for a definition of neuroma in the MRI scan, the transverse diameter should be more than five millimeter. But there's only one paper which says five millimeter was a little rest. Most of the evidence says size doesn't make any difference. Um, the other factor is obviously, you know, somebody's operated on a neuroma and then it's come back. I think that's a very good case where if you've had surgery, I think there's a very good injection that you would try an injection. So those are the indications and contraindications where injection might work, might not work. Um, if somebody's got tight calf muscles, I wouldn't, I mean, I, I think we know that if you're putting a lot of pressure on your forefoot, if somebody has got big hallux valgus deformity, these are the things which in general, you know, uh, whatever you do, whether you inject or operate, they, they come back. Okay, thanks very much, Manish. So um, I think we're now out of time for any more questions. Um, so I think on behalf of both, I'd like to thank all of our uh, speakers, um, particularly Manish and uh, Matthias, uh, for joining us while the football has been on. Um, so we're going to uh, now say goodnight uh, and hand over to uh, Mr Ritchie to close the session. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'd like to uh, start by thanking all of our presenters, Adrian Kendall, Manish Bhatia, Vidya Dukia, and uh, Matthias Raab for a fascinating evening's session. Uh, I'd also like to thank my co-hosts, Dave Townsend and Con Luizu. For myself, uh, I've been delighted to learn that I can continue injecting Morphin's neurometer with steroid with gay abandon, um, although I've also been intrigued to hear that orthotics apparently are of little benefit, perhaps more studies there. Matthias has presented us with a very cogent and logical argument for why we should be decompressing rather than excising neurometer. Um, so maybe that does represent the way forward, although uh, it may mean I have to get my old loops out and polish them off to see if I can actually spot it all that accurately. This evening's presentation, of course, is one of a series of uh, virtual journal clubs, and the next session is scheduled for the 19th of August on the subject of midfoot trauma. To whet your appetites, uh, I can hint that at least one senior American for an ankle surgeon uh, is being asked to present. 
I don't think I'm allowed to release his name at this stage, as I believe Bofast is still negotiating with his agent. However, details of the session will be circulated uh, in July. So watch this space. Before I close, I think I need once again to thank our sponsors, DJO. One of the most main pressing purposes of BOFAS, or perhaps even its sole raison d'etre, is education. And education, although priceless, sadly comes at a price. Delivering it in these days of COVID has become increasingly complex and difficult. And without the sponsorship of DJO, we'd have struggled to keep the programme going. So once again, thank you, DJO, for supporting surgical education. Beyond that, I'd just like to thank everyone for attending. I hope it's been a useful set and educational session for you. So thank you. And on behalf of all the panellists and both us, good night. The Aircast Air Select Series. The Elite, Standard, and Short. Synonymous with comfort, control, and healing. The most advanced and lightest full shell pneumatic walking boots available. Air Select. No other walking boot offers more. Soft strike technology dissipates force through the heel strike. A patented grid design puts a matrix of shock-absorbing material in contact with the heel. The result? Cushioning that reduces heel loading and prevents impact-related stresses. The integrated inflation system is easy to use. Patented air cells put the patient in control of a customized fit. Exclusive duplex technology combines the semi-rigid shell and overlapping air cells that produce a graduated compression to promote faster healing. And Air Select semi-rigid shell has structurally engineered vents that maximize airflow and minimize mass without compromising support. Its unique shell is trimmable and heat moldable, making it easy to custom fit the boot. The Aircast Air Select series, the ultimate combination. Designed for comfort, engineered for healing. The Aircast Air Select Series.